All right, next up, we have Baruch Spinoza. And Everett just sent a message. He had to leave early for a meeting with Steve Jenkins. So Okay, thank you, Christina. Yeah. Um, Baruch Spinoza, his family came from the Iberian Peninsula, where modern-day Spain and Portugal are. And if you're familiar with history, the Moors had conquered that part of Europe during the expansion of Islam. From like 632 to 732, Islam spread all the way from the Saudi Peninsula um, to the Pyrenees in France and to the um, into the subcontinent of India. It was just this massive expansion of Islam. And Islam was finally stopped in Europe by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours. And I'm trying to remember what year that was. Um, Wayne, would you Google the Battle of Tours for me? <laughs> I lost a date in my memory. I, I think I it was around that. the 1707 or something like that. It, uh, but um, that's a guess. Been, it would have been a little bit earlier, I think. Battle of Tours. Was it like 723? Uh, October 10th, 732. Seven, see, there's my dyslexia <laughs> rearing its ugly head. 732, thank you. Is that right, 732? That's correct. Okay. So it was an epic battle between these Christian defenders of Europe and these Muslim invaders coming from the south. Well, by the time we get to the 15th century, by 1492, the reason Columbus was able to sail the ocean blue was because the kings of um, Castile and Leon, these two king, Christian kingdoms in northern Spain, had intermarried, and they combined forces, and they systematically drove the Muslims from the Moors from the Iberian Peninsula. And when these conquering Catholic armies were victorious, they gave the conquered peoples a choice. And because there were a lot of Jews and a lot of Muslims living in the Iberian Peninsula. And the choice was, you can convert, flee, or die. Those were their three options. You can become Christians. You can leave the country. We'll let you immigrate, but you have to forfeit all your lands and stuff that are here or we'll put you to death. You do not get to stay in Spain as a practicing Jew or Muslim. That was not an option. There was no religious freedom or toleration. And so Spinoza's family decided to immigrate and they immigrated to Amsterdam. And just like today, Amsterdam was like a free thought city, a lot of toleration, a lot of diversity. And so they set up like a Jewish quarter in town where Spinoza lived. And so he was still brought up knowing the Torah, learning the Hebrew language, learning the Hebrew scriptures, but he was living in a Christian continent and a Christian country. And so he also knew about Jesus, the New Testament, the gospel. And he took the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 very literally. And what that passage says is, hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord is God, God. The Lord is one. one. And that means God is not two, he's not three, God is one. And since God is the totality of reality, you cannot have God plus anything else, which means everything that exists has to be contained within God. And so here's Spinoza, this 17th century Jew living in Amsterdam, but for all intents and purposes, he is a pantheist like we would find in India or China or Japan, because he believed all is one, all is God. There is only one thing happening, and that one thing happening is God. But he was quite comfortable calling God nature. In fact, in a lot of his writings, he would have God slash nature, because to him, it's just two different ways of talking about the same thing. We can talk about God in naturalistic materialist ways, like chemicals and compounds and plants and animals and stars and all the physicality of the universe we can describe as God, God manifest. 
or we can talk about God in the abstract, like spirit, like concepts, like ideals, um, more in like a platonic way. And that's equally acceptable. It's just two different ways, the way of mind or the way of matter talking about the same thing, which is God, God or nature. And so his solution to Descartes' problem was, he said, Descartes got confused. There is only one substance in the universe. And this is interesting because the way that the medieval scholastics define substance, and this is really important, so write this one down. Substance is that of which is self-existing and self-consisting. Let me say that one more time. The medieval scholastics define substance as that which is self-existing and self-consisting. And based on that definition, there is only one substance in the universe because only one thing satisfies that definition. And that one thing is God because God is the only thing that is not dependent on anything else for ex existence or continuance. God is self-existing and self-continuing. Okay. Descartes rolls out two substances, and Spinoza's like, no, Descartes, those are attributes. There is only one substance, and that one thing is God, and God has infinite attributes. Thought and extension, or mind and body, are simply two of the attributes of God we know about. But all you're doing is you're describing God either mentally or physically, but there's still only one God. Let me talk about this concept in a different way with the idea of free will and predestination. I love, absolutely love Spinoza's solution to the tension between free will on the one hand and predestination on the other, because logically they're mutually exclusive. The way Spinoza deals with it, he says, it's just two different ways of talking about the same thing, because only one thing is happening. Just like only one being is existing, only one event is happening. There is only one time, one place, one now, and you're in it. And so if we use my arm here as like a timeline, and this is like when you woke up this morning and you travel throughout your day, and here's where we are at the present. And when this class is over, different potentialities are going to open up to you. You could stay in your room with your computer, watch YouTube videos, work on your homework. You could go for a late lunch. Um, you might go drive down to the beach. You might go take a nap. Um, you may have another Zoom class after this. You have all these potential forks in the road that you could do. But see, the same thing happened when you woke up this morning. If we slide this back, if this is the wake up, <laughs> you could have hit the snooze button. You could have gone in and made a hearty breakfast. You could have taken a shower. You could have skipped it. You could have driven your little brother or sister to school. You have all these different things you could have done. But see, if you look back to this morning, only one event happened, right? There's only, you only have one history. You don't have five different histories of what you did today. You woke up, you picked one of those five choices and it collapsed into one. And then it brought you up to this new fork. Well, God already sees and knows what you're going to do after class. So when God's looking at this point, he's seeing this from his perspective. We're seeing this from our perspective, but only one thing is going to happen. And guess what? It's the thing God think is going to happen. <laughs> I love it. So it turns free will predestination argument really into just a perspectival difference because only one thing is happening and we're just talking about it in two different ways. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. They called Spinoza the God-saturated man. But this makes perfectly sense, right? Because if you are a pantheist, if you believe everything is God, whether you're e eating, sleeping, swimming, driving, studying, reading, what you're consuming, what you're engaging in or with is God. All of it. That apple you eat was God. 
it was God eating God. This cup of coffee I'm drinking, it's the God in me drinking the God in my cup. And the cup is God too. We're, we're all God. We're just different manifestations of God interacting with each other. And so Spinoza is bringing in something completely different, but it is solving Descartes' dualism because pantheist, pantheism is monistic. It only believes in one reality, and that one reality is God slash nature, however you want to talk about it. Another interesting work of Spinoza's besides his famous meditations, and he really gets you by the definition of terms. So you really, he also, a lot of these modern philosophers are also mathematicians. And that's exactly how they're writing out their philosophy. It's like a mathematical formula. So what they're going to try to do is get you to agree to their terms. And if you agree to their terms, then they're going to plug them into like formulas in which they'll come to their conclusions. And so if you agree with, the, with Spinoza's definition of substance, you're in trouble because he's going to take you right down the pantheist hole immediately. And there's no way you're going to get out of it. So be very careful what terms you agree to. But see, he didn't make up that definition. He was using what came to him through the philosophic tradition. He simply took it for literally what it meant, what the ramifications were. And I don't know, do any of you have any thoughts on that? Do you believe there's more than one substance in the universe? But see, if you say yes, you're going to have to define substance for me. And it's not going to be the same definition as the medievalist. Remember, their definition is that which is self-existing and self-consisting. And I only know of one being that matches that definition, and that being is God. Because he has always existed, and he is not dependent on anything or anyone for his continued existence. Same the rest definition. of us were created and dependent for our continued existence. I can't keep myself existing on my own. I'm dependent on outside energy, outside sources to keep myself alive. God is not. Christina, go ahead. I'd say God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. They're all self-existing. Yeah. Right, but they're all God. They're not three it's, gods. They're technically three substances, though. No, just one substance, three persons. Otherwise, we get into heresy and polytheism. Poly <laughs> One one substance, three persons. The, the official creed is one God, three persons, but here God and substance are being defined as synonyms. Okay. I would I would agree under that definition, um, God is the only substance that exists. Um, I do think there's pretty clear differentiation between God and the created and then like his breath and his spirit that he put into what he created. Um, and then later on, the way he put his Holy Spirit to dwell with, within what he created. Um, right. So I feel like the biblically, if you just read it sort of straightforward, um, I don't think too hard about it. There's a general distinction between God and his creation. But right. if we want to be like super, you know, shrinking down to what has eternally existed forever and ever and ever, that would be just God. Um, Let me see if I can pull up a, a quick image that you made me think about. Can an eternal God create a non-eternal substance that is separate from him? I think would be the question. Oh, yay. Look at that. First image out of the shoot. Can you guys see that? Can you see that? So this is generally how classic theism is portrayed, where you have a creator who is separate from his creation. So you have God, and then you have nature but God is separate from nature. What Spinoza is saying is no, God 
and the universe or God equals nature. God and nature are the same thing. There's no distinction. It's just two different ways of talking about the same thing. This is what we would see in like Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, a lot of new age religions. And then this position is called panentheism. And so pan means all, theism means God. So this literally means all is God or God is all. Panentheism means all in God or God in all. So now we have God and the universe itself is contained within God. It's not like over here where you have the universe outside of God. And I have a real problem with this classic theistic model because it's actually limiting God. That's a problem. This model does not limit God. But you see how God is like half as big over here? Because half of reality is apart from God. Here, reality is contained within God. It isn't God, but it exists within God, not separate apart from him. And this is actually the position I hold. And then if we were talking about naturalist, we could just get rid of pantheism here and God here and just write universe. And that would be like a naturalist materialist because they don't believe in the supernatural. They only believe in nature. No God, just nature, just the universe. And so those are like our major worldviews we're kind of dealing with here in the West. But Spinoza, as part from some of those ancient Greek, but even they were more materialistic than pantheistic, even Parmenides, um, because he thought the totality of reality was physical material, where the Hindus, the Buddhists, it's spiritual. And Spinoza is simply saying, you know, it can be physical, it can be spiritual, it doesn't matter. There's just one thing, and we can talk about it in different ways. So hopefully that chart's helpful for you. I, I sure enjoyed that one. Another book he wrote was called um, Philosophico Politico Treatise. And when I was at San Diego State, I had the great um, fortune of having my graduate advisor was a Spinoza specialist. In fact, that was his nickname around campus was they called him Spinoza because he was like a little Spinoza disciple. And I had, because of the things that had happened in my life, I, I had to drop out of graduate school. And it actually turned out I had taken enough courses to graduate. I just had to do my dissertation or you could test out. Those were the two options. You could write a, a like thesis and then defend it. And, you know, that could be a couple hundred pages, like a, a massive term paper sort of. Or you could take three tests in different philosophical areas and they'd give you your master's degree that way. I tried to write a thesis, but I couldn't make it stop. In fact, it's still going to this day. So I, I decided I need to take a test, but because I had not been able to be in school for several years, after seven years, you start to lose credit for the classes you took. And so I had to challenge some classes to show them I still knew the material. And one of those was Spinoza. And so I actually chose to go from my um, thesis to doing the three tests. And I picked Spinoza for one of my three, just because I had finally learned to be successful in school, you need to know your professor and cater to their interests and their needs. And normally I was just the opposite. I would find out what my professors were into and then I would attack it. But that, that's how I like to study because then you got those real intense um, classes. Some teachers appreciated it, some did not. Um, this teacher, I simply wanted to show him I had a philosophic mind and I could master his, his favorite, right? And so he was so excited because he knew I taught at a Christian school and I think he wanted to free my mind from my dogmatism or my indoctrination. And so he said, let's read Philosophico Politico 
or theological politico treatise together and we'll go through it. And I was like, great. And what this book is, it's Spinoza's commentary on the Bible and all the little inserts and editorial comments that got put into it. Because, you know, that's one of the key hallmarks of fundamentalist evangelicals is this idea of inerrancy, right? And so Baruch, knowing Hebrew, he went through the, he knew the Old Testament. And if you are a scholar of the Old Testament, you will know exactly what he's talking about. And even as a kid, it struck me weird. You'd be reading through the Old Testament, and all of a sudden in the middle of Genesis, there'd be some comment, like, like when they, I think they rolled a stone up as a memorial um, at the springs or at the Oak of Mamre. It was and, 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel because God had brought them oh, across, I think, well, the Jordan River. That. Thank you. Well, I'm not talking about that one, but th this is a different one, I think. But it, it doesn't matter. The point is, then you'll get this little editorial comment that says, and it is so to this day. <clears throat> so that's obviously not being written by Moses, right? Because it just happened. Why would you write, it is still so to this day, if you just did it? So whoever's writing that comment is writing much later and they're acknowledging you can go down to the river right now and the stones are still there if you don't believe me, right? And so he's speculating that it was probably scribes during like the time of Ezra or Nehemiah or Josiah where they found the lost books of the law when they were cleaning the temple. And <clears throat> when they recopied them, you probably had these little insertions put in. And I just thought it was fantastic. And let's talk about inerrancy for a few moments. What does that mean? What is that biblical doctrine of inerrancy or infallibility? Which one is a stronger term, inerrant or infallible? I've heard both used and theologians confuse me sometimes. I'm like, well, which one is it? Is it inerrant or is it infallible? And is there a difference? Hopefully you can tell me, because I don't remember at the moment what the difference is between inerrant and infallible. Do you remember, know, Wayne? Give me, give me one second. I've got to okay. know. What. If I was a Bible major, I would know the difference, but I've forgotten. You could call Dr. Moulton and figure it out. No, I don't want Dr. Moulton to know that I don't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'd probably harp on you for that one. <laughs> no, so they, they sound like... Dictionary-wise, at least. Um, we need like a theological dictionary for this one. I know both Moulton and Witten talked about it, but I cannot remember. I'd have to look back at old notes and... So I have notes from a uh, previous theology class through uh, my ordination class. So infallible is trustworthy, uh, John 17, 17. And then inerrant is uh, true and clear. Yeah, that's the same thing. That's not helpful. Mm. <laughs> right? Doesn't that sound true. like the same thing? To me, it Bible seemed, versus true. To me, it seemed like infallible was more like conceptual, like the meaning is trustworthy, and then inerrant. To me, like it seemed like without error, like even like right. every word was inspired by God. And every like, jot, you know, every tittle is right yeah. where it's supposed to be, right? I think inerrant is actually stronger here. There's some movements where they change the meaning of one of those words, and so it made it less strong, and that's why some theologians are pushing back against it, but I'm not involved in those kind of inner theological squabbles, so I, I don't really know what the, the issue is, but anyways. What does that mean when we say the Bible is inerrant or infallible? What are we talking about? Am I talking about my my Ryrie Study Bible, King James version? Is is this book inerrant that I'm holding here in my hands? I can't tell you how many times I've been in church 
and seen a preacher hold up his Bible over his head and say, and this is the inerrant word of God and slam it down on the pulpit. And I'm just sitting there in my pew thinking, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Cause I know, even though I love the King Jimmy, I know there's stuff in here that we don't even have manuscripts for. It just appears within the text. Now, if you're a King James only person, you could say, well, of course, Blackburn, because this corrects the originals. This was God's revealed truth to us. And I just don't have that kind of faith. I'm sorry. Even though I love the King Jimmy, I'm not I'm not into that kind of. Well, and then there's the question of like which version is inerrant. Well, right. So which one is, Autumn? When people say the Bible is inerrant, what are they talking about? Yes, go ahead, Wayne. Uh, for me, it was uh, as originally written. Okay, right. And that's the technical theological answer is in their original autographs, we believe the scriptures are inerrant. Okay, now, and I sign that every year and I have to to teach at this school, but I sign it because I believe it. But here's the tricky part. How many original autographs do we have of the Bible? <laughs> you did that so well, Christina. Thank you. Big goose egg. That's the we sign have, language for zero, but I was just we thinking have, of the Dead Sea Scrolls. and Right, but none of those been. are original autographs. Those are copies of copies. Uh, much older copies. Um, so the, is it zero Isaiah or am I pondering? is 100 BC. I mean, that's awesome. And it's virtually identical to what you'll find in my King Jimmy. So is it zero or am I just completely spewing no, out? No, you are, you are absolutely right. We have oh. no zero <laughs> original autographs. All we have is copies. And it was so funny. Um, Steve Witten a few years ago was telling me, isn't it wonderful how the Bible is virtually identical with the original manuscripts. And I said, uh, and you know this based on what? I'm like, did you have them out comparing them to each other the other day? I mean, what was, how are you making that statement, Steve? And he tried to give me all these evidences and reasons. And I said, unless you, and he tried to use the Isaiah scroll and saying, look, if, if it's been, 2100 years since that scroll was copied and our modern translations of the bible and that scroll is only 300 years out from the original writing of it if we can count on it not changing in 2000 years then we can extrapolate or infer that it didn't change in those 300 well that's an inference it's a strong inference i think it's a good inference but it doesn't prove it in order to prove it, you would have to compare the Dead Sea Scrolls, the modern translations, and the original autographs to see if they were identical. That's how you would do it. But we cannot do that because we don't have any. <laughs> so to me, I'm basically pledging something that could never be challenged. I'm saying, yes, I believe in something that doesn't exist. That's a weird thing for me to do every semester, but I do it because I want to teach here. And I do believe in the Bible, but it's not because of evidence or archaeological digs or manuscripts. It's because of faith. God has given me a faith to believe that this is his word to me. Now, I don't mind adding a caveat of as long as it is translated and um, and shared down through posterity correctly i mean that makes sense to me that you got the right bibles the, the right books in the canon that you have the right collections but see even all of those how did we canonize the bible which books got in which didn't who gets to say so and i'll never forget in bible college um back east we were going through just like in steve witten's theology classes major bible doctrines and we got to biblio Bibliology. <laughs> I always say it wrong. I always say bibliolatry, but it's bibliology. Um, 
Bibliolatry, of course, is the worship of the Bible and turning it into an idol. Bibliology is the study of the Bible, it's, which is what we should be doing, not, not the former. And I always make fun of Steve about that. But in my back east school, um, I asked the Bible professor, I said, were the people at those church councils inspired by the Holy Spirit who decided what books should go in the canon? Were they inspired the same way that the people were who wrote the Bible? And he looked at me like I was stupid. And he said, of course not. And I was all upset. I said, well, how do we know they got the right ones? I was really upset because if they're just using human reason to decide which books are divine, that's not going to end well, is it? They need to be inspired and led by the Holy Spirit to compile the Bible just like the people who wrote it. And what if they left the book out? That was my big fear when I was young. What if they left out, and yea, and verily, unless you pray towards Jerusalem five times a day, thou shalt not be saved. I mean, if something like that got left out, I want to know about it. But now that I've gotten older, I realize I can't even live up to what's in there, let alone be worried about them leaving stuff out. So I've kind of chilled out a little bit. But it's a great question. What if we discover in some archaeological dig a manuscript that is one of the lost books of the Bible. And I'm talking about books that are mentioned in the Bible by biblical authors, but they're not in the canon. For example, um, I believe Paul mentions the epistle to the Laodiceans in another one of his epistles and is telling them, read the letters, send them like trading cards with each other of these letters I've written. <clears throat> and we have it recorded. There was an epistle to the Laodiceans, but that is not in my King James Bible. What if they dig it up in Laodicea in 2024? Do we add that to the canon or is the canon closed? And if it's closed, who closed it? And so these are the kind of questions in this book, um, Theologico Politico Treatise, that Baruch Spinoza is raising. And he's showing, um, because this is after the Protestant Re Reformation, and Amsterdam is living in one of these reform countries with the Dutch Reform Church. And Spinoza is brilliant. And he says, it's no longer the Pope or the Pontiff that reigns supreme in Christianity, but it is now the theologians in the Protestant world. Now the Pope still reigns supreme among Catholics and the buck stopped with him. If there was a theological dispute, he would settle it and say what was true and what was false. But in the Protestant countries, you didn't have a Pope anymore. You didn't have a head of the church. You had the theologians telling you what, how to interpret the scriptures. But what if you disagreed with those theologians? See, the theologians became the new power brokers. They became the ones who were in control. And if you look at evangelical Christianity today, we don't have a pope. We have some megachurch pastors. But who carries the real clout in evangelical circles and culture? It's the theologians. They're treated almost like gurus or demigods. And people will quote them like they're quoting a creed or the scriptures. Well, Ryrie said, well, Schofield said, well, John MacArthur said, it's just like, yeah, well, bully for them. Are they getting direct revelation from God? Is their word equal to scripture? Do they have any more right to interpret the scripture more clearly than I do? And so these are the questions and the observations that Spinoza is bringing up. And we're way over class time. I just got a little too excited. But I love Spinoza. I'm not a pantheist, but he's just like brother love because he's just going around like, I am you and you are me and we are all in God and there's just one thing. And he was supposedly one of the most moral upright people that have ever lived. I mean, people, even though he was a heretic in his culture and the Christians asked the Jewish community to kick him out because he was corrupting the Christian youth with his wild pantheism ideas. He was just Mr. Lovey-Dovey. He loved everybody. And it's amazing that so many people 
could not tolerate him. All right. Have a good afternoon, y'all. Thank you. You're welcome.